Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to um, tonight's webinar. Um, we've got a uh, very um, interesting subject to share with you this evening. Um, my name is uh, Quentin Daniels. I'm the um, business development manager for W9, uh, specifically in the um, surgical area. Um, and uh, W9 is the exclusive uh, importer of um, uh, ethos and has been for the last um, four and a half years. Um, we also work closely with um, three uh, dealers um, in Australia, um, Medident in uh, Victoria, um, City Dental in South Australia, and we've also got VP Dental and Medical in Queensland. Um, um, if you could please um, uh, feel free to um, put your questions in the Q&A um, and these will be then addressed um, at the end of the presentation, which should go for about an hour. Um, Dominic has a number of um, actual cases that he's recorded that he'd like to share with you. So um, it will certainly be worthwhile um, staying to the end. Um, I just uh, wanted to um, introduce uh, Dominic. He's, a, um, he's an experienced dentist from the UK and he's been placing and restoring uh, dental implants for many years and undertakes all aspects, including bone grafting, sinus surgery, guided bone uh, regeneration and immediate full arch implant bridges. Um, he has a particular interest in working within the aesthetic zone, crystal sinus augmentation and immediate implant placement. So this webinar will focus on the aforementioned. Um, so I'll hand you over to, uh, to Dominic now. Hello, everyone. It's uh, wonderful for me to be here speaking to you all. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, nine o'clock in the morning here in Yorkshire, in, in England. And um, really, it's a case of trying to grasp your interest with regard to two specific things. How I use a site-specific implant with ethos to kind of synergize between the two and, and really sort of make my patients happier than they thought they were going to be, if you see what I mean. So, um, you know, I've been a dentist for nearly 30 years now. I know that's hard to believe when you look at me on here. It looks like I've been a dentist for about 50 years, but um, I've been placing implants for about 15 years. Uh, my practice is peripatetic in Yorkshire. And um, I really, really have focused more and more on immediate placement and loading within the aesthetic zone. Um, I'm not entirely going to just focus on that for the webinar. I'm going to, I'm going to try and just mix it up a little bit as well. And I've got some interesting videos at the end. Well, I think they're interesting. <laughs> You'll have to see what you think. It's just to show you a case that's not in the aesthetic zone, but it's quite an interesting use of ethos uh, together with a quite an unusual implant that I think you might, um, you know, it might uh, interest you and it might sort of raise some questions in your mind. So just a quick disclaimer, I've got no financial links to anybody um, apart from uh, my family, where all my money seems to go, um, which is a good thing. Uh, all these cases are my own and, and I'm quite opinionated. So you might find during the course of this that some of my opinions are a bit left field and right field and all, all over the place, but that's just me. Um, so as I said, I come from the most beautiful county in England, in my opinion which is Yorkshire, and here's Ribble's Head Viaduct, which is quite near me, uh, a, a wonderful feat of engineering. And I suppose this, this picture shows there's a synergy between man-made engineering at its very finest and the natural landscape. And um, that's, I suppose, a slightly tenuous link to the synergy that I'm trying to show you with my slides today, which is the man-made dental implant and also the man-made graft material but that's replaced by nature with true host band so that's that's an off the cuff me trying to be clever moment for you so i live in a place called menston it's a little village in yorkshire um and it's uh, it's it's very picturesque it's a lovely place to live 
it's a lot of Yorkshire stone houses. Um, and it's, it's, I moved there in January this year. I used to live in a neighbouring village called Geisler. And I think the last time I did the webinar, I was, I was there. And, you know, it's, 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 because I work in three different practices, I I tend to see the very best of the county. So I travel to different areas within Yorkshire and um, and really see the best of it. So what do I actually mean by synergy in this case? Well, what I'm really going to talk about in these cases is the synergy between site-specific implants. That means an implant that's basically designed and engineered for a specific site in the mouth together with ethos and trying to get an outcome that's actually bigger than the sum of the parts and can we do that and you know i'm going to be quite anecdotal i'm going to show you some cases but there's interestingly there's some papers coming up and there's one very interesting paper that i'm involved in it's going to be published very soon that adds a little bit of meat to the bones with regard to this synergy but i'll leave that one hanging for now so the first case is about a chap called Gabriel. Gabriel's a younger chap um, and who uh, was unfortunately assaulted and had his upper left central incisor fractured. So you can see it there. Um, this is after his, his own dentist had tried to rebond the crown of the tooth back on. The tooth had also been root filled and so the crown was stuck back on. That happened three times over a period of two years. And the third time it was stuck back on, obviously they didn't do a very good job of it. They left him with a measles astema and a rather ugly appearance, which for a young chap is not ideal. And so he came to me and he wanted something doing. Um, and he was on the cusp of being old enough, in my opinion, to have a dental implant when he first came to see me. We waited a little bit longer. And then when he got to the age of around 23, we were thinking it was appropriate now. Facial growth continues through life, as we know, but the real speedy vertical facial growth had sort of ceased and his shoe sizes weren't popping up any anymore now. So let's look at the CT scans. So this slide shows us that we've got an intact labial plate, but you can see really, if you look carefully at it, you can see the, the problems we've got with the crown of the tooth, which has the characteristic fishtail fracture, fractures mid third, on the labial side of the tooth, but it tracks down right down to the palatal uh, root, enamel root jun junction really on the, on the palatal. And you can see on the CT that he's already lost bone here. The root filling has left him with a small pal periapical radiolucency on the, on the apical portion of the root. Um, so generally I think the tooth is unrestorable uh, and he agreed and we decided to replace it with a dental implant. And so we took the tooth out, or I took the tooth out, and I uh, don't know why I was nervous. Well, I do know, but I'll tell you that later. I was a little bit nervous taking it out, but uh, I think I traumatized his gingiva a little bit, as you can see here. So we, we took the tooth out, there you go. And there you can see that I've taken a nice little bite out of both the labial and the palatal mucosa. When I was taking it out, he's got an intact socket. We degranulated the pal that we remember on the apical. And then we decided to place the first of these site specific implants that I'm looking at today. This is made by a company called Southern Implants and it's called the inverter implant. And it's quite a novel design. It's got a body shift, which means that it's a, the apical and middle third portions of the implant are um tapered and then you have a body shift down to a more parallel narrower portion in the coronal third and why would you do that well you do that for several reasons but one of the reasons is that you want if you're doing an immediate you want to get high primary stability you want to be getting an insertion torque over about 35 newton centimeters if you can to improve the predictability of your immediate loaded restoration lasting through that implant stability drop, which is going to be for the first five to six weeks of after placement. Thinking about that, so you've then got this narrow coronal portion on the implant. And what's that for? 
Well, what that's for is to improve the jump gap. So the jumping gap labially, as we all know, when we place an implant, you normally you place it fairly palately and you end up with a fairly chunky labial jump gap. This particular implant also benefits from an internal angle correction, something called coaxis. And that allows me to place it right down the middle of this ridge for this chap called Gabriel, which means that the jump gap's gonna be circumferential. It's gonna be accentuated towards the labial, but it's gonna be circumferential. There's gonna be jump gaps both at the mesial and the distal near the opposing, near the adjacent teeth, but also on the palatal. And that's interesting and important here because if we reflect back, Gabriel had already lost a little bit of palatal bone height. And I think that was due to the fishtail fracture there. And so we placed the implant and that implants down the middle of the ridge, right down the center, right into the triangular bone that that ridge is provided us with. If you look carefully at this image, you'll be able to see that there's a little dot on it, on the implant, and that's actually a rotational angle indicator because the implant has the internal 12 degree angle correction. And that means that that screw hole that you can see down that implant there is tilted 12 degrees to the palatal. And what does that do? I'm not expecting the computer to shout at me, it does this, but what I am expecting is to just think about this. What we're doing is we're, we're creating a screw channel through the palatal cingulum of the incisor. So we can go screw retained. We've got an ideal screw channel position. We're not going through the incisor edge and having to do cement retained restoration. And I've got loads of room for me to place ethos. Now ethos, an alloplastic graft material that is fully resorbed within 12 months. Even at 10 weeks, we've got over 50% resorption of the material. The calcium sulfate portion of the material dissipates over a period of weeks and creates vascular channels for basically neovascularization within the graft. And it rapidly re resorbs and is replaced by a host bone. And what I want when I've got an implant in place for my younger patient is I want host bone. I want this patient to have bone that's gonna be adapted to functional load. The patient's gonna be chewing on this implant. I want the bone to respond to that. I don't want a lump of scaffold that's just gonna sit there neutrally for many years. Yes, I do want something where the host bone is of a sufficient quant quality and quantity that that response to the implant loading doesn't mean that the labial burn goes away. The last thing we want is that labial burn to thin down and end up with gray shine as the implant shines through it in years to come. Remember, he's a young chap. What I want is I want industrial bone. I want bone inside that cortical plate that's got marrow in it, that's full of growth promoters and can and can be stimulated by the actual micromechanical movement of the implant under load very much like the osteocytes within haversian canals are, are responsible for the osteoclastic osteoblastic action within the uh, house bone as we see it whether it's a large bone or whether it's the smallest bone in the face what i want is i want on that husband to respond to that implant loading. So here we go, I'm, I'm gonna load it. So we've got way over 35 Newton centimeters insertion torque, we're up around 80. We've placed a peak cylinder, a peak is a polymer. It's useful because it's very tough, but it's also useful because it's easy to adjust at chair side. So I'll place that, so you can see the position of that compared to the implant, it's tilted towards the palatal. And here I've placed ethos. Now here I've placed 0.5 cc of ethos tranches down the circumferential jump gap. And what I've done is I've left it scattered around a little bit during this photograph so that you can see that this is a real world case and I haven't wiped it copiously with loads of saline to make the perfect photograph. And that's important because let's be honest, this material's got calcium sulfate in it, which is in solution. And the last thing I want to do is re-dilute it and re-dilute it and wash it away which will actually decrease the ability of the uh, material to work optimum. 
And here we can see my attempts at polishing a chair side pickup crown. And here it is placed. I've placed this to 20 newton centimeters into Gabriel's mouth. And you can see here that you can see the trauma quite clearly. You can see the trauma towards the distal of the isthmus on the labial of his gingiva. And if you look carefully, you can see a little bit of ethos peeking through there too. So let's see what happens. It's obviously not a great aesthetic outcome for him on day one. Not at all. Close up, you can see that he's got a, if you believe in biotype, it's a thick one. But you can see that trauma there and you can see the contour of the crown compared to the gingival emergence. And here you can see a sectional CT scan taken immediately after placement. And you can see that we've got the ethos down the, nearly the full length of the socket. It's not quite to the apex there. And you can see the position of the socket uh, originally. The socket was there and the socket was um, towards the labial. You can see the implants down the center of the ridge and you can see the screw is angled 12 degrees towards the palatal. And that's it after 10 days. And what's interesting to me anyway, is that you can see that that ethos is epithelialized already. And we've got a positive response from the gingiva. The distal papilla, particularly between the central and the lateral has not diminished in size at this early stage whatsoever. And here we see it after a few weeks. Look at that. If anything, if you look very carefully, we've actually got a little tiny bit too much gingiva now. If you look at the gingival zenith on the tooth, you can see it's actually about 0.5 of a millimeter below. It's a Persian tooth. It's an adjacent tooth. And here you can see, so still slightly unesthetic because this the gingiva is slightly prodigious there. We've got the papillas both in place, but we've got a slight triangular form on this provisional tooth doesn't really fit in with the occlusal scheme. But he's very happy with it. It's nice for him to have a tooth that's so much better than the rather ugly looking effort that was there at the beginning. Mm. And here you can see the gingiva and you can see the beautiful collar that we've got formed there. This is the first time that provisional has been taken off and you can see a little bit of bleeding there. That's not because we've got inflammation. Look at that, look at the ridge preservation I've got there. Look at, compared to its uh, adjacent teeth, can you see the position and shape of that ridge? We've lost no ridge volume at all. So we take an impression, a modifying impression coping. Again, this impression coping shows you the angulation of the screw channel. I'm gonna get my colleague upstairs, Phil Reddington, an amazing ceramist to make us a crown. And he really takes his time. Believe, believe it or not, interestingly, it can be more difficult to make a crown for a central that's lacking in features than it can be to make a crown for a really old gnarly tooth. We try in the internals before the, the outer portion of the crown is bonded down. And there you go. And then we're starting to make a bit of an improvement now. You can see that there's about a five degree cant at the front there. And that's related to the shape of the upper right central incisor. It's impossible to do anything about that unless you create a divergent diastema easily. And look at the gingiva now. Look at the way that the emergence has changed over time. And here you can see the implant, a periapical radiograph, and you can see the ethos in the coronal portion is already changed there to host bone. And we're getting bone around the corner of the platform shift. And this is at two years after placement. And look at the re retention of that labial contour of that ridge there. And look at the palatal bone that's come back there where it had gone before. And I don't know about you, but I'm very pleased with that result. Yes, it's not absolutely perfect. If you look at the zeniths, it's not quite as pointed as his right central incisor. It's a bit more rounded. You look at that cant again at the centre there at the front, it's maybe less than five degrees, a bit two to three degrees, but it's noticeable to the keen observer. But it's a very good result. It really is a pleasing result. And that's the synergy 
of an implant given as room for the ethos to be converted to endosteal bone to then provide adaptive functional loaded bone in the longer term. Right, so let's look at the second case, moving swiftly along. This lady, a lovely lady called Cynthia, and Cynthia had had an implant with me about 10 years before on her upper right lateral incisor. Her two central incisors were both post crowns, and the crowns were coming off regularly, and there was evidence of vertical root fractures on both teeth. However, there was something rather interesting going on with a left central incisor. I seem to have a predilection on these uh, presentations for the left central incisors, but here's another one for you. Looking at this, as you can see quite clearly, we've got an enormous cystic lesion at the apex of the tooth. We've got something going on with the coronal portion there where somebody's tried to create a very wide post to hold this crown in. And the root form is not really appropriate for some form of heroic dentistry to try and save the tooth. Secondly, it's not really an appropriate case for immediate load at the moment, because if I try an immediate load with an inverter implant, for example, down the middle of the ridge, it's gonna drop into that lot enormous area up there. So what we thought we'd do is we'd do a papilla sparing flap design, a Luca option ob can shine, can never say it, flap, really to preserve the papilla because we've already got some black triangles that we can see on that first photo. And then we removed the cystic lesion from the upper left central. We removed the small pile from the upper right central incisor. We removed further root tip and we cleaned and degranulated as well as I possibly could. And then ethos was placed. And there you can see a, a radiograph showing ethos on the tip of the left incisor and on the right incisor too. And there you can see a post-operative CT with a shadow of myself in the background, uh, which shows the ethos after placement then. You can see that it's fully filled the cystic lesion and you can see how I've took the apex of the tooth off as well. And this is after I'm on the ceiling and you can see that the scarring is pretty minimal really. And there's no change at the moment in the uh, black triangle positions on those teeth, which is testament to the flap design. Nice healing. However, the patient was still suffering from recurrent crowns coming out from both central incisors. So we're in a position here now where about four to five months after I placed these ethos grafts at the apices of the teeth, that we decided to do immediate placement and load. So we took the teeth out and we used the inverter implant again with the co coaxis, the 12 degree internal angle correction. And we placed those implants using the rotational guide again. You can see it on the carrier here on the upper right central. You can see that vertical line is that I've got the rotation correctly. There's also a depth indicator. It needs to be the correct depth too. There's both implants in and healing abutments are placed. If you look carefully, you can see circumferential jump gaps on both. Peak abutments placed and then some nice messy ethos for you again. I'm not keen, as I say, on washing it away to get a good photograph. And there you can see that we've used two different sized implants here. So the, uh, the inverter on the left side is two millimeters longer, it's 15 millimeters long compared to a 13 millimeter one on the right hand side. And there's my old biomet implant that's many years old sitting there at the lateral. So we've got three implants next to each other here. Ooh. So it's really important that we get endosteal bone between those implants because we need to ensure we've got a good blood supply for functional bone. Looking particularly at the left one there, you can see the ethos graft down the jump gap. And there you can see a really appalling set of temporaries that I made chairside that day. And a little excuse on my part is that we were really running late and my patient, had her compliance had diminished towards the end of the appointment. So we were getting on with it as quickly as we could. And we placed them and I refined them at a later date. But there you can see after a couple of days, they don't look great, I'm afraid. But we refined them. 
And three months later, we decided to take impressions of these two implants. And that's just after fitting them, the crowns. That's about a minute after fitting them. You can still see a little bit of blanching on the right central incisor there. On the left, you can see a little tiny bit of bleeding there around the top. But what's interesting to me is that there's been absolutely no increase whatsoever in black triangles from pre-op at all. And this is where it gets very interesting. Whoa. That's two years after placement on the left central incisor. Cast your mind back to that apical cystic lesion. Look at the bone that we've got there now. That's the wonder of what ethos can do in combination, in synergy with the right site specific implant. So moving rapidly on, there's a chap called Tony. And we're going to take things away from the left lateral left central incisor now. And we're going to move to another part of the anterior mouth. We're going to look at the mandible and we're going to look at a mandibular incisor. This chap, many, many years before, he's an older guy. He'd lost one of his central incisors and the teeth had been crowded down to fit the space over time. He'd ended up with trauma to one of the, the, the remaining central and he'd had a heroic dentistry to try and save it. That included a malpositioned post crown and it included an apisectomy that included the use of amalgam as the retrograde root filler material. The tooth was on its way out, I'm afraid. As you can see from this sectional slice, <clears throat> you can see we've got quite a, a decent ridge form for the anterior mandible. We've got a lack of bone on the on the labial. There's possibly a hint of bone there on the CT. And we've got really a tooth that's not that needs to be filed in the round file as soon as possible. It's really a failed tooth. And there you can see it in the mouth. Again, he's got nice gingiva. Um, he's got a small triangle between the two of them. Uh, the tooth itself had, had had a ceramic crown and that had fractured and then had a composite repair. But generally, the appearance of the crown there does nothing to show you the, uh, the fun and games that's happening in the root portion of this tooth. So let's go back to that. This time we had to raise a large flap. And you can see here that after preparation that we've got no labial plate whatsoever. So we've got basically a complete labial dehiscence and we've still got on this particular image you can see that we've got if we go back here again you can see that there's a scar visible and if you look at this photograph you can see the scar has got impregnated itself into the bone so the scarring gone right into the bone there towards the center of the shot so we've placed an inverter implant again the reason I placed an inverter here is because the apical portion can really get high primary stability in this beautiful mandibular bone that's still remaining. The coronal portion is narrow enough that the whole implant, if you think back to the morphology of the ridge, is within the envelope of the bone. Whatever you do, don't place an implant that's going to be sticking proud of the envelope of bone. You're not going to magic any bone graft in the world that's going to suddenly give you that bone back. What's going to happen is your implant is gradually but surely going to emerge through that. And you're going to end up with bone where it was before with your implant standing proud. It's the last thing I wanted to do. I wanted an implant within the bony envelope and that remaining distance to be then augmented predictably with ethos. And as you can see, we've placed ethos now and the ethos has been contoured. And a couple of things to note here. One is that I've not overdone it. So the, the ethos is not piled high. That isn't the principle of ethos. The principle of ethos is to allow a substrate that enhances host bone turnover and creates an environment where the host can heal as well as possible. And here we want that to happen. Putting more ethos and bulking it up, as you might do, for example, with the xenograft, <clears throat> That's the wrong thing to do. That could possibly actually diminish your neovascularization and actually dec decrease the outcome that you get rather than using ethos ju ju judiciously and not overdoing it. 
And here you can see I've sutured, and it's uh, that's immediately after placing a provisional crown. Right in the middle of the photograph there, that's a provisional crown loaded on the day of placement, despite a full labial distance. So let's just go back. What happened now? We're in the middle of the COVID epidemic, and Tony's partner is medically compromised, and so they were both shielding for many, many months. So he came in for his sutures removed, and then I didn't see him. And I didn't see him for nearly a year at all. And then he came into the practice. What's interesting on this photograph for me is, yes, it's got calculus all over the teeth, but, I, you know, there's many dentists that look at that and they won't realise that was an artificial tooth in the middle there. Look at the gingiver. Whoa. And this is a weird case because this is a case where I actually prefer the provisional crown to the final crown. And this is where the, the patient has used his input to actually create something less aesthetic in my view. But anyway, here we go. So we'll take an impression and look at that gingiver again. And I didn't have a lot of room for error with that in the implant. And you can see if you're really astute, you can say I had to adjust the uh, impression code and so I wasn't a button against the other incisors. And that's his finished crown. So we go back a couple of shots. That to me is the pinnacle, really. Once the calculus was removed, I think that's the pinnacle. I think it's aesthetically extremely pleasing and it fits so harmoniously in with this guy's dentition. This one doesn't. He wanted these black triangles reducing and the technician has tried his best here. But the bulbosity is slightly too increased in my view. However, the patient's delighted. That's the crown. And you can see the lovely emergence there. You can see the screw channel coming through the, the lingual. That's the radiograph again, showing the position of the, of the implant. And that's the ridge form. And look at the preservation of the ridge there. And that's truly... A wonderful result in, in my view. I'm so pleased with it for him. He's such a lovely chap. And I'm so pleased we've achieved this for him. And because I know I've got functional host burn there, of every, every, you know, every hope that this is going to remain stable in the real long term. We've not got some scaffold there that may get infected. We've got functional host bone here. So let's move on to. Michael. Now, Michael is a cool guy. Michael is the father of one of my implant nurses, and the pressure was on. Now, this is a case where we're opening it up a little bit, and we're trying to make it a little bit more. This is this is a really quite an advanced case, and this shows some more techniques. And I hope during the case that you find this one quite interesting, and, and there's some of the things you may not have seen before. So Michael attended and his upper right canine to upper left central incisor bridge had failed in several different ways. So the bridge itself was aesthetically very displeasing due to enamel, uh, due to porcelain fracture from the metal substrate, due to um, uh, basically the margins of the bridge being visible. But more seriously than that, both teeth had failed. The, the canine had got a vertical root fracture and the central incisor had got a horizontal root fracture that tapered down onto the plate. Both teeth were regarded as really not predictably restorable. And what we're trying to do here is we're trying to push the boat out a little bit and use site-specific implants with ethos and with something called a tentic technique using a PDS suture to really try and improve the outcome for this guy with regard to an immediately placed and loaded provisional bridge. So interestingly, from the occlusal, you can see that he's got severe, he's got some scarring on the edge of the uh, palate there, you can see that. He's also got a really, really big width defect on this ridge, right where the pontics are on this bridge. And here's a CT scan view, and you can really, really show that it's, uh, go back to this image, you can see it's a mirror shot. So just to, don't want to confuse you, but it's actually the same side. There you go. What a defect. 
if you look at both the teeth that we're considering extracting, you can see that both of them, if they, if, if they have any labial bone, it's minimal. And yet he's got a thick biotype here. You can see the size and shape of the incisive foramen. So we've got a lot of things to be thinking about with regard to this case when we're going to place some implants. And that's the central incisor. And you can see there that we've got that failure of the tooth completely horizontally down towards the palate. And you can see that there's a, there's definitely some labial plate there, but it's 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 marginal. It's very thin on that CT. And the canine, and you can see it's grossly failed, really. Um, we've still got a good palatal wedge of bone there, but we really don't have much evidence of labial plate there. There perhaps is some towards the coronal, but in the apical third, I'd say that there isn't. What's interesting here, and to keep your eye on, is the little anatomical feature that you can see um, towards the right-hand side of, the, of this picture, um, the little circular vessel that you can see. Keep your eye on that in the future. And you'll see why. So we took the teeth out. And I'll be honest with you, taking that canine out wasn't very easy. I really assure you all that I don't traumatise every single case I do. But I've traumatised his ginger a little bit here as well. Really difficult to take out. Now, what was interesting is that his uh, canine didn't have a labour plate. And I hadn't took it off by the extraction. It just wasn't there. The central did, but it was way too thin. So what did we do? We raised a flap. The flap had its distal releases way out of the term where I was thinking of placing ethos. Now you're probably looking at that and thinking, some of you will know what that is and others won't. That is a 2.0 PDS suture, which is resorbable over a period of over 180 days. So it's a monofilament resorbable suture. And I've placed four little homes, holes in the bone using a stabber lock green pin drill. Finally, there's a use for these dentine pins. And I've manually placed sections of this suture into those where it forms a tent. And the tent is to really allow the ethos to be stabilized in this large, wide, deep defect that we've got, remember, in the pontic area. So we place the first tranche of ethos and you can see it there. It's restored the form of that ridge without overdoing it. Ooh, and what am I doing here? So I've now placed two more stabber lock green pin drill holes on the coronal apex of the ridge, on the top of the ridge here. And what I'm trying to do here, and I think this is the first documented example of this, is I'm trying to actually create some vertical augmentation using the PDS suture tenting technique and ethos in combination. And there you can see I've placed more ethos to create a vertical tent. I've placed peak abutments. You can see the ethos is over the, the, uh, the labial distance that's right down that canine. And then we pick up this provisional bridge. This was made upstairs by Phil. Again, PMMA to temporary. I've picked it up using the peak abutments and I've used flowable composite. And then I've chair side polished it to create a reasonable emergence. And then I've placed it. There's some uh, PTFE sutures visible there and there's some ethos. I think I sometimes like to splash the ethos around a little bit. But seriously, I don't like wiping it off with water. I like leaving it be. So that's maybe five minutes after the placement of that bridge. Ooh. That's 10 days after placement of the bridge. I'm going to take the sutures out, taken a few of them out there. I've still got that one to take out. That's interesting, isn't it? That's interesting what's happening to that gingerbread. And that's his permanent bridge. And that's his permanent ridge. And just cast your minds back to where we were before, thinking about that deep horizontal width discrepancy there. 
So this bridge has just been placed. I haven't even filled the screw channels yet. And you can see some blanching there. And you can see the position of his pigmented lesion on his gingival where it was before. And now things get really interesting. Look at that CT. So you can see that both implants now are well clothed in bone. You can see the position of the incisive foramen compared to the image that we looked at, the CT cross-sectional view we looked at before. And that's the canine. So we've gone from a canine sitting really labially on the bone there to an inverter implant that's completely clothed in bone. And cast your mind back to that little anatomical feature, that vessel that we could see towards the left hand, towards the uh, top of the slide. Can you see how much bone we've got there compared to that pre-op image? That's the wonder of ethos when you give it room to work, when you don't overpack it, when you don't overfill it outside the envelope, but when you can try and restore the envelope, but occasionally you may need to tent it. Look at the central. Wowzers. So yes, we did have a label plate here, but look at that. Look at that bony contour that we've got around that inverter implant there. So we're going to go to an, another case now. This is this is an immediately loaded mandibular case. And this case is we're going to move away from the site-specific inverter implant. And we're going to look at an implant that's more specific for immediate placement in the molar regions, both in the maxilla and the mandible. Now, Frank's a cool guy again. So I've got a few cool patients. This guy wanted to push on with an immediate here, despite having this. So this patient didn't want to have endo done here because this tooth had a vertical root fracture, as well as the more obvious issues with two large apical piles here. Plenty of room above the in, in, inferior dental nerve, but not an obvious candidate for an immediate placement perhaps. And yet we decided we were going to use a southern max implant here. This implant's a big chunky implant. It's a tapered implant with a seven millimeter width at the coronal, about nine millimeters long. It's way above the level of the, inside, of the inferior dental nerve. But why go longer when you've got this massive surface area of this implant with this lovely table for the implant to support a molar unit? It's an X-hex implant. Mm. XX, XX is ideal for a case such as this. This guide fractured his, his first molar, a heavy bite. I want the strongest pl platform possible for my crown on top of this implant, a nice wide platform. But I still want room to be able to play this ethos. Here you can see a view now to show the position of the implant, trying to engage the intra-radicular septum of bone between the two roots. And some of you might be thinking, well, you must be mental doing that. Why, why the hell would you do that? But we did it. Here's a, a mock-up from the CT showing the position of where I want the screw channel to come out on the new tooth. So you can see where it's coming out on the existing tooth. And what am I doing here? So here's the tooth in the mouth. And if you look carefully, you can see that it's got a hole in it all of a sudden. So that's basically what I'm using here is I'm using the tooth as a template for my initial osteotomy. And here you can see a drill in place. And I'm creating my osteotomy to engage that interradicular septum of bone and to keep myself on track. And now I've sectioned the tooth. And you can either take the crown right off down to gingival level or you can section it such as this way. And there's my max implant placed. And here we've achieved 90 Newton centimeters of, of insertion torque. This implant is a testing implant to place. You need experience and you need to know what you're doing placing these. You don't want to be placing towards the labial or the buccal. You want to create at least two millimeters of space so that you've got room for endosteal burn again in that really critical buccal contour. And so we take the carrier off. You can see the external hex of the implant. You can th see three dimples on the top of the implant. And that is to allow the carrier, we'll go back a slide, that's allow the carrier there 
to engage that so that it doesn't deform the hex because these implants do achieve high primary torque, high insertion torque. Healing abutment placed, ethos placed, circumferential jump gap yet again. We're also placing down the roots of the tooth and into the piles where the piles have been carefully degranulated so that we're not leaving granulation tissue there. In this case, I was far more successful with my ethos placement in the mesial root than in the apex of the distal root. There's no pal there now, but there is a blood filled cavity there. Now you could ask yourselves, well, okay, you haven't really managed to get ethos right down that root. For me, I think it's far more important that you try and achieve ethos augmentation in your mid and coronal thirds of your roots than in the apical third. The body's pretty good at getting new bone in the apical third of roots. It does it predictably. So for me, it's much more important you try and get it in the coronal. And this is after a week. So you can see already that we've got incredible closure at a period of a week. Quite fascinating to me that I see this. And then we move forward to about 10 weeks after placement. And with the max implant, I think it's quite important to take a radiograph with an external hex that you make sure your carrier is fully engaged. It's quite easy to think it's engaged and it isn't. And here you can see a photograph of the carrier in place and a good emergence of that coming through. And look at the gingiva around that now. Take a manual impression using flexi timer as a material. I quite like it. It's, uh, I use Improgum as well, but I like this material. And then I get my crown made. That's the soft tissue model there. And you can sort of see the position of the crown. There it is. It's normal. Well, maybe I didn't get exactly in the center of the crown for the screw position, but it's not bad. And there's the lovely emergence on the crown. And this is so important. It's got a wide table where it's sitting there on that wide implant. It's providing a really good dissipation of functional loaded forces through a big implant. But at the same time, it's got a nice emergence due to the depth that I place the implant. There it is in the mouth. Blanching is visible. It's just been placed. And you can see the blanching there. And you can see how even immediately after placement, it's looking pretty good. And here's the radio. And you can see that we've got bone around the corner again. So we've got bone around the platform shift of this implant. And we've got that beautiful emergence so that flossing is entirely possible here for the patient. We haven't got that tulip effect where the crown is far wider than the narrow little implant connection. And going back to the point that this patient busts this tooth, remember, this patient's got a hard bite, this patient occasionally books this. Nothing's going to last forever in a books this, but we want to give it the best opportunity that we can. So now what we're going to do, we've done a lot of talking, I will have done a lot of talking, and we've, we've looked at a lot of slides. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk over some videos. They have got animation on them. They actually do annotate them as, I, as I'm, when I was doing the videos, as I was placing implants on this patient. But what I'm going to try to do is I'll, I'll just talk over them instead because they, it's quite hard to hear my vocal efforts. So this tooth is an upper left inside, uh, upper left molar tooth. So again, unpredictable, restorable. The patient's got a, a thin wall of bone it's intact, it appears to be intact beneath the floor of the sinus. She's got pneumatization of the sinus between the roots of the teeth. Um, but you can see that she's got a reasonable um, interradicular bone between the five, which has got some caries on it, you can see there distally, and the seven. In this video now we look at, you can see that I'm talking about the Really, what we can see when we look at the slice through the tooth, so you can see that we're now tracking up through the roots. And what I'm trying to do here is just show you the size of the pile that we've got on that palatal root. And as we track through the roots, you can see that they diverge, and you can see that we've got very little in, in regards to interradicular septum here. So this is not an ideal case for an immediate placement. 
by any stretch of the imagination. But I think if we've got a site-specific implant to engage that remaining bone, if we've got the use of Versa, which is a technique to densify the bone and spread the bone in that interradicular septum, if I've got the opportunity to use Ethos, which predictably can give me new bone, then at least it's worth counselling the patient that we may be able to do an immediate placement here. Even I wouldn't consider an immediate live bone. And so you see, you can see a clinical photograph of the tooth now. And here you can see that I'm using the tooth again as a template for my initial osteotomy. And you can see here that I'm using the initial, uh, I've done the initial lance drill, I'm now using the pilot drill to just create and enlarge the osteotomy in the correct position 3D. At the same time, being very aware of how deep I'm going so that I don't perforate that thin cortical plate beneath the sinus floor. And you can see there that I've really taking care with this to just make sure that my angle's correct in 3D. So it's correct, uh, mesodistally, apico, uh, plato, buccally, and it's the correct depth as well. So all these things uh, with high water ir irrigation. And we go up a size. So here you can see now that we're, we're going up a size and we're enlarging the osteotomy. Um, and you can see that I'm taking great care again with my positioning here to make sure the positioning is just right. And then using high irrigation, a lot of irrigation, and just placing this osteotomy with great care so that I don't perforate that, the uh, floor of the sinus there. And we'll go up a size again now. We're going, we're still using the tooth as a template. And I'm going up to a step drill now, which is starting to give me the tapered form that I need. This drill can kick, so we need to be very careful. 1200 RPM. Careful to have good finger rest there and keeping, keeping the drill stable while I use this to enlarge the osteotomy again. You can see. And here you can see a mirror shot now showing the osteotomy down the central part of the tooth. And what I've done there, you can see the little notch towards the palate. I've just started the process of separating the three roots as well. And you can see that that's, that's to show you that there is a wall of tooth still there, but I've created the osteotomy through the tooth to allow me to have that real assistance in the guided position there to allow me to be correctly down that into the ridiculous septum of the bone. And here you can see now that I've separated the three roots. And you can see quite clearly there that we've got the palatal root, we've got the mesial buccal root, and we've got the distal buccal roots, and they're all separate. And now you can see that I'm using Zeph elevators or Zeph luxators to, to help me carefully and atraumatically take the roots out. Remember, I've created an osteotomy here in a minimal bone case. I've got a large pal uh, that's visible uh, on the CT scan. The last thing I want to do is re re remove remaining bone by injudicious use of these elevator stroke luxators to remove these roots. I want to try and take great care over it. It's important that you're resting on, on the interradicular, but uh, the, the, the interceptal bone between the teeth, you're not putting any pressure on bone that you, you don't want to. You don't want to damage this socket any more than you need to, to get these roots out. And here they are. And you can see the root, three roots are in place now. No bone on them. What's interesting is that there's no piles on them either. So there's no apical granulation tissue on them apart from on that middle root there. You can see a small one on that, perhaps on the other, on the right one as well. But there's a lot more granulation tissue to get here. And I've got to re-emphasize to you all, if there's anything that's important to get from the use of ethos in immediate science, you must degranulate and then degranulate and then degranulate again. You don't want to believe in your granulation tissue. And so I'm degranulating here with a sharp curette. I'm cleaning the socket very carefully. But at the same time, I'm not putting lots of pressure on. The last thing I want to do is fracture, infracture that bone at the apices there. 
but I can feel that I've got a pile still there and it's, it doesn't really want to come out. So now I start using the ethos degranulation drills. These are drills made by a company called Strauss and they come in four sizes and they've got really uh, rough um, uh, industrial diamond on the, on the circular tip of the drill and used correctly with high irrigation. They're an excellent drill to remove further, degranul uh, further granulation tissue. So again, it's the case of no pressure, we minimal pressure and a careful technique to just clean around the socket margins, spending time thinking about those last little fragments of granulation tissue to make sure that I've got clean bleeding bone when I've finished so that we can go forward perhaps with an immediate placement and we can go forward with the optimal placement of ethos. And now we're back to the sharp curette, <clears throat> feeling again. I want to feel and I want to make sure that when I'm going down there now, I'm not feeling granulation tissue now. I'm feeling that scratchy feeling of clean bleeding bone. And now we're moving to the Versa drills. Versa is a, a Versa is a company that makes denser drills. These drills are used both clockwise and also counterclockwise. When they're used counterclockwise, they can be used to densify bone, which means they spread bone. And almost as a reverse Archimedean principle, they can spread bone apically and also um, laterally. And the, the excellent technique to allow me to actually do a crestal sinus lift here to create room for ethos crestally as well, to really create a really, really optimal bony envelope for this implant. So I use this here. And you can see I'm just gauging where it is first, and then I'm using it to just create that initial deeper osteotomy without penetrating through the sinus floor at this stage. So I'm just notching the sinus floor cortical bone at this stage. Very great care is used here. There, very end then we penetrated through the sinus floor and went about a millimetre through. And now we've lifted the sinus floor about five millimeters, and that's really pushing the boat out with Versa. Versa would tell you three millimeters should be your predictable maximum increase in sinus floor elevation for a crest of a lift. Here I'm going five. I'm doing that because I've got spring back on this and I've got a direct visual access to show that I've got no perforation of this sinus floor at all. She's got a resilient sinus membrane here. And I decided let's let's go five and I did go five and here we've got the drill in position. I am getting spring back and feel like I've got, I've got no I've got resistance as the drill goes to its depth and it's wanted to spring back. And you need to confirm that. And I'm a little bit loath to use the Valsalva maneuver to confirm it if you think you've got a thin sinus membrane. But you, if you can have a really good look with your loops and, and with a direct line, you can really have a look and make sure that you're not, you haven't perforated. And here now I'm going to use the Versa drills in a different way. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to actually use the Versa drill counterclockwise again. So using it in that reverse Archimedean principle, but I'm going to use it to place the ethos actually up into my crystal lift. And so I'm going to use the, the drill much slower and I'm not going to use irrigation on it. So here I'm going to mix the ethos as I normally do. So clicking the syringe first to make sure the ethos is particulates are free within the tube. Withdrawing the plunger, placing some sterile saline into the tube up to the same level as the ethos. Mixing the ethos together carefully. As you can see there, putting the cap on carefully again. Mixing the ethos, keeping my finger on the end of the cap. At the same time, not pulling the syringe down too hard so that I pull it out of the bottom of the syringe and leave my ethos all over the side. When I've mixed it thoroughly, taking care to hold it upright and depressing the, taking the cap off with care. So I don't lose that dark dissolved calcium sulfate. Taking some of the moisture away, getting the right mix. I want the right mix here, which is a medium mix. And then we're on the next stage of this, which is placing the ethos into the socket. So we're going to place the ethos now into the socket. And in this case, 0.5 cc is going to be placed as one single tranche. There we go, into the socket. 
what I'm going to do now is I'm going to use a DGD packer, which is an Ustamed instrument. I'm going to place the ethos carefully into the three molar sockets. And at the same time, keeping a big tranche of ethos within the central osteotomy. And then we're going to use the VersaJog counterclockwise slowly at between 50 and a maximum of 200 RPM counterclockwise with care to push the ethos up into the crestal lift. You can then grab some ethos from the coronal portion of the socket and bring it down into the crestal lift again and again, as you can see I'm doing there. But at the same time, great care. I'm not ramming it up there to try and really damage that synodarian membrane. So there we go. Then what we're going to do is we're going to finish the preparation. So what we do, I've done here is I've waited five full minutes now until all that ethos is set in that crystal lift before I use this final max drill to create the correct taper for my max implant. So some people have said to me previously when they've seen this video, they said, well, why, why the hell are you using water? You're going to wash your ethos away. I'm not really bothered about washing a little bit of ethos away from the coronal. I'm not worried it's going to wash the ethos away from the apical. I just need to get that taper right. And with a drill this wide, I'm not going to use it with slow drill protocol. And I'm also not going to use it with no irrigation because it'll get too far too hot and it'll cut the bone. So there we go. Finishing the finishing the article, the coronal pre preparation there. <clears throat> and now I'm going to tap the site. And the reason I'm tapping the site is because these wide implants can crank up to very high torque very, very quickly. You can go from 10 newton centimeters to 100 newton centimeters in a single turn if you're not careful. So it's important to tap the site. And reflecting back at what bone wheel at the beginning, you might be thinking, well, God, have you got bone enough to tap it? Yeah, I have. I have got bone enough to tap it. And I think it's really important to do that. So I'm going to tap the site now using a tap that's exactly the same shape as the implant I'm going to be placing. So the taps you slowly, very slowly. And I tend to use it at around 50 Newton centimeters here. So that then when it locks at the right depth, I can then reverse it out. And I've got the opportunity if need be to go up to 70, uh, 70 Newton centimeters if it's locked in place. If it's still locked, you've got a hand instrument to take it out, but try and avoid that. And now you can see I'm placing this max implant. And if you look carefully at this slide, you'll see that it's got the normal hyper-textured portion of the tapered implant towards the apical and the middle portion of the implant. But it's got a machined portion, the MSC portion, in the coronal third. And then it's got a gold carrier above it. Now, interestingly, this machine portion is of the philosophy that machined implants don't seem to get peri-implantitis quite the same as the hypertextured ones do. And if they do get some bone loss, they don't get infected in a way that's very difficult to predictably treat. So it seems like an interesting idea to me. It's almost like your tissue level implant, but here what you've done is you're creating a bony union in the less critical portion for immediate implant integration but at the same time you are getting predictable integration so i'm going to place that implant now i'm using an implant hand piece to do this and as i say i've tapped the implant site so i know that i've got a very high opportunity to get this implant in the correct 3d position uh, without either tracking the implant off in an unusual direction or locking the implant before i've got the correct um, depth the implant's going in nicely there. And you'll see that it's got horizontal guide markers on the carrier there to allow me to get the correct depth of the implant as well. And if you need to finish it off with a hand instrument, then you should do so. But ensure that you tighten the carrier up if you need to do that, to ensure that that carrier needs to be about 40 newton centimetres tightened before you start using very high torque with a hand instrument. And here you can see the carrier is in place now, and you can see that there's ethos around it. I've placed further tranches of ethos now into the coronal circumferential jump gap. I'm coming back to that whole concept again, circumferential jump gap around the implant head. And here we can see now I've taken the carrier off and you can see that, that 
ethos around it there. I'm not going to attract these slide these videos too long. You can see what I'm talking about there. And now we've got healing abutment on. And you can still see that I've got further circumferential jump gap to fill. And here you can see now that I've filled with a further 0.5 cc of ethos up to the level of the healing abutment. So the socket's now got a circumferential jump gap fill with three separate tranches of ethos, one in the crestal lift, one in the sockets, and the final one in the coronal portion of the crown of the tooth. And here you can see immediately after placement, you can see a large crestal lift there. And you can also see ethos in the circumferential jump gap. You can see a good position of the implant. And here you can see now we've moved forward three months and we're taking impressions and we've got the model ready for the provision of the crown onto this now. And here you can see the crown on the model and the nice emergence that I've got there. And here you can see the crown in the mouth again. And here you can see the crown loaded to 40 Newton centimetres onto that implant. You can see the platform shift. You can see the bone around the corner yet again. And you can see that fairly large, well-condensed coronal, sorry, um, crestal sinus lift there. I'm really, really pleased with that case. And it just shows synergy in action from beginning to end. Oh, just before we all finish, and I'm sorry over and over a little bit here, but uh, do you remember that first case, Gabriel? You might not remember it. You might have been absolutely bored so much now that you can't remember back to them. But think back to Gabriel at the beginning. Well, that's in there. That's his tooth. And that is why I got a bit nervous taking it out, because he's my oldest boy. Um, and that was at my stepdaughter's wedding. And uh, smiling like a good one there. The other handsome chap on the on the left side of the thing is, is my son Rufus, who's 21. And then there's uh, me uh, with my beard as usual. So thank you all so much. Um, thanks for sticking with me. Honestly, it means so much to me that, that you've, you know, you've spent the time today to, you know, to, to listen to everything I've had to say. And I hope you've found some value in, in, in the cases that I've shown you. And, you know, if I don't get to answer questions now, I'll make sure you put your questions in and I'll make sure I get them answered for you and they get sent back to you. All right. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot, Dominic. Um, it's a lot to take in. Some uh, amazing cases that you shared with us, um, and it's particularly the really big cases where you uh, where you used ethos with some amazing results. Um, so thanks for sharing with us. Um, we're a little over time, so we won't um, take up uh, too much of your time. And um, I just wanted to share or share a few things with you. Um, I'll, if you don't mind, I'll just take over the screen. I'm just going to share a slide. Right. Um, okay, which is, uh, so this is just a slide that I wanted to share with everyone, um, which is just to, to, um, to share or to give you the contact details, um, uh, should you have any questions, um, or need any follow-up. So I've got Dominic's, um, email address on there, um. Ashley Shadok, who's our um, clinical trainer and um, has been looking after Ethos for a number of years now. Um, if you have any questions, you can ask her as well. I've got an email and a, a mobile number, and of course mine. Um, and I also wanted to draw your attention to the uh, Facebook um, Ethos Case Studies um, uh, group. Um, and uh, Dominic has um, uh, actually put on quite a few cases on there. So please feel free to go on and have a look at it. And then also we wanted to um, share with you that we've got a, um, a uh, roadshow um, slash workshop with Peter Fairburn. Um, he'll be on the 25th of October. We've only got a few um, spots left, so please um, uh, register. You can just go to uh, Dent Events um, and register online. Um, then the other thing I also wanted to share with you is that um, we've got uh, Peter Fairburn will also be at the ADX um, in the CPD program um, on the 27th to 29th um, of this month. 
Um, and um, the other bit of housekeeping as well, that um, we will receive a survey in the next couple of days. Um, if you could please um, uh, complete that for us, that gives us some kind of feedback as to whether we're on the right track and if there are certain areas that we need to improve on. And if you, um, is this the kind of content that you'd like to continue seeing um, from W9 moving forward. Um, your CPD points will also be emailed to you in the next week. Um, and for those of you who wanted to revisit some of these amazing cases that Dominic shared, uh, you will be receiving a recording of the webinar um, with the email that you that you, um, you know, registered this, for this event as well. And then I, again, I just wanted to thank um, our, uh, our dealer um, uh, network at, uh, for those of you who want to purchase um, Ethos, you can get it through uh, Medident in Victoria, uh, VP Dental and Medical in Queensland, City Dental in South Australia, and Arc Health in New South Wales in Queensland. Um, I'll just stop sharing. So we're back to you, sir. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm sure there's a couple of questions, but because of the, the, um, the time, we'll get those answered by Dominic, and then we'll send you the um, responses afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now.